Sometimes I get asked to build things. It's really inconvenient, but people ask me to build things every once in a while. And so when I'm asked to build things, I have to figure out what platform am I going to put it on? Am I going to build this application on Windows, on Linux? What am I going to do? Now since, of course, I'm at the Zen Developer Summit, you can pretty much guess that I want to have Zen involved somewhere. Ten years ago, I would have had two choices for my platform. I could have used Minios, and there's my fantastic cheap Minios logo for you on the right. Um, or I could use Linux, and those were the two options I had. Now, if you fast forward from 10 years ago, and I'm glad the math works out on this, a couple of years after that, uh, we had support for FreeBSD, and we had support for Windows, and that was pretty cool. But I still had this sort of bifurcation. I could either use a full-blown OS that gave me everything I wanted and much, much more than I actually wanted, or I could use MiniOS, in which case I had to build everything myself. So fortunately, Anil and I saw this need and rose to the challenge to meet it. And so we developed Mirage OS, which you can't see the Mirage, so that's nice. Um, <laughs> and the HAL VM, which is the, uh, the unikernel that uh, I wrote. Sometime after that, uh, people started using, I noticed at least, it, uh, embedded versions of Unix on top of Zen. So that was a way to slim down all the pain you got from trying to run Fedora or CentOS or something. You could trim it down using BuildRoot or something like that. And then my colleague Jonathan, in, after the break, will be talking about a free RTOS uh, port to Zen that we did um, this past year. But there are a lot of options that I can choose from. And so the whole purpose of this talk is to try to figure out which one I should choose, when I should choose it, and why I should choose it. So when I'm building this application, I have this huge continuum that I can work from with full featured OSs on your left and uh, uh, many your ones on the right. And so I actually don't want to talk about the outside edges because I think if you need them, you know you need them and I'm not going to convince you to change your mind. Uh, if you need Windows, you probably should run Windows. And if you feel the need to go all the way down and build everything from scratch with MiniOS, or if you need a real-time system with free RTOS, you already know who you are, so go do what you need to do. So I mostly want to talk about the middle. And in particular, I'm going to talk about unikernels, uh, like Mirage, like the HelVM, like MiniOS, like OSV, uh, ClickOS. There's a whole bunch of them these days. So what are unikernels? Unikernels are, um, and I'm thank Anil for the term, uh, they're also known as library operating systems. They're single purpose VMs, usually written in a single language. Uh, initially, they were mostly high-level languages, but you can get them in C and other things now, too. Uh, and these are just virtual machines that run one program that is directly compiled to run on Zen. So there's no Linux, there's no all the libraries that you're used to, it's just that one application running on Zen. So, unikernels, who, what, why, or why, when? I think I got that in the right order. Um, that's the title of my talk. Uh, just as an outline, I've sort of told you about the what, so I'm crossing that out already. Uh, so we only got four to go. Um, First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of unikernels at a high level, just to give you some outline and scope of why I think they're good and where I think they fall down. Then I'm going to talk about where my company, well, the company that I work for, called Galois, has used them and where we've been successful, and one in particular case where we were not successful with unikernels, and sort of what we've learned from the experience over the years. And at the very end, I'll try to generalize some of the rules that I think apply, and how you can make decisions about if unikernels would apply for your project or not. So let's take a, a standard operating system. At the bottom, we have the operating system kernel, like Linux or FreeBSD, or OpenBSD, if you prefer. Uh, on top of that, we have a whole mess of libraries that do a whole bunch of cool things, general purpose. And at the very top, we have a bunch of applications. And those applications use some of the libraries. One application will use this one, another application will use that one, and so on and so forth. So if I'm building my application, which there's my widget again, and it turns out in this case that's all I want to develop for this system is I just want to do that one uh, widget. Those applications go away and I'm left with now my widget, all these libraries in the operating system. But the truth is I probably don't need all of those libraries and of the libraries I need, I only probably need small portions. So if I were to map that, you know, the, the darker parts are the parts that I actually really need for the system. So one of the benefits of unikernels and one of the reasons that um, I developed mine and I think Anil developed his is so that we could basically throw away all the parts that we didn't need and thus shrink everything down to exactly the subset of all the libraries that we need for this application. So why on earth would we do such a thing? I think there's three big reasons that we've found at Galois why you would do this. 
Uh, the first is money. Um, when you do this, you get a reduced memory footprint, uh, which means you need less memory in the VM. You're paying uh, Amazon a great deal to get. Um, you get a greatly reduced need for disk space. Linux really likes having a disk, and if you don't give it a disk, it gets very sad. Um, you can use RAM disks uh, to get around some of these problems, but it's unikernels make it very easy to just not use a disk because you don't need a disk, so let's just move on from uh, the disk space uh, cabal. Um, in addition, unikernels frequently give you a reduced computational burden. You don't have a kernel in the way. You're not doing all this extra library support that you might not need. So in addition to buying a uh, lower memory EC2 instance, you can also buy a lower uh, CPU powered EC2 instance, which gets to save you money. Or if you're running this on a local Zen cloud that you just have in your office, you can use the same hardware to do more stuff because you can put more on each individual instance. The second reason to do unikernels, and uh, Anil w sort of is a big fan of this one, is speed. Uh, unikernels, again, you get a reduced memory footprint, which helps you in the TLB, it helps you in the cache, it helps you in all sorts of interesting ways. You also don't have any extraneous processes taking up your CPU. It's really, really hard to get Linux to just have one process. And even if you do, you're still going to have the Linux scheduler sitting there round robining that process, which takes a little time. Very little time, but a little time. So you can get fewer schedulers in a unikernel, which, again, very nice. And when you do this, you get faster load times, much lower latencies, uh, and so on. And the final reason, and the reason that actually Galois got really interested in unikernels in the first place, is that you get reduced code size, which helps you in security, right? You have a reduced uh, attack footprint for people to attack you. You also get a lot more heterogeneity across your applications, because you're just taking separate slices of each of the libraries that you want. Right? So this application is going to use this slice of libz or whatever your library is. This other application is going to use this other slice. So if an attack is made on zlib, you, it will only affect the unikernels that use that particular library call, which is an interesting thing from a security perspective. It keeps from sort of knock-on effects of an attack. Um, so you get, in addition, unikernels are a little, uh, uh, they haven't been used widely. So you get a bit less of an attack service that way too. In general, with a unicorn, you get sort of less exposure to general attacks. You get less exposure to things where every single HalVM or every single Mirage instance is subject to some sort of attack. Um, you can also build lots of small components, which you can then wire together in interesting ways, which allows you to deprivilege each of those components in turn, which allows you to have um, safer knock-on effects or um, uh, fewer repercussions of a failure. So a failure in a smaller component, um, as long as you can block it from affecting other components, can keep your, the security of the system as a whole intact. So with all those wonderful things, I'm sure you are just all screaming to use unikernels in every project that you want to use. But I'm sad to inform you that there are actually some reasons that you shouldn't use unikernels. One of which is, you may recall this whole application stack I talked about before. Turns out, in many applications, you really want this application stack. You know, sometimes the problem really calls for a LAMP stack, in which case, just use Linux. Uh, it ain't broken, so don't fix it, um, and just go ahead and use that. The second reason is that when you cut things down into these small pieces, especially in the newer unikernels, and even in some of the older ones, some of these pieces won't be around for you. So you're going to have to build them yourself. So there is an increased development time cost with many of these unit kernels, where maybe that ver little bit of libc isn't actually available in the HalVM or isn't available in Mirage, and so you have to write it yourself. So again, there's a lot of software for Linux. When you use unit kernels, you may have to reinvent some of it. So, and the final thing I want to talk about right now, I'll get back to another reason later, is that I said you can save money with unit kernels because you get all this reduced footprint and all that sort of stuff. I really should have put an asterisk on there because I was kind of talking fast. Um, these savings come from the fact that you are not doing some things. So even if you're in a unit kernel and then you try to do those, you're not going to save money. So for example, you can save money on an EC2 instance because unit kernels can use less memory because you don't need a disk and so on. However, if your unikernel application needs a lot of memory and needs a disk, you're not going to save money by using a unikernel. It just doesn't work out that way. So 
if your application needs those things anyway, and the whole purpose of this was to save money, you're not going to save money. Again, there's other reasons, but that's something to keep in mind. So that's it for the generics. Now I'll talk a little bit about how we've used unikernels. Um, I'm just going to throw a corporate slide up there. So there, la la, corporate slide. Um, I work for a company called Gawa. We do research and development services for a, a bunch of different clients uh, in the field of computer science. Uh, the reason I bring this up is we do a lot of different projects that have very different shapes and very different scopes. And sometimes we look at a project and go, ooh, a HalVM would be really useful here. And sometimes we look at a project and go, oh no, no HalVMs here, thank you very much. Uh, and in one uh, particularly memorable case that my engineers won't forgive me for, we say, ooh, a HalVM would be great here, and then we find out it would not be. Um, but when we think of unikernels and when we're looking at our projects, we think unikernels work really great in sort of three clusters of project types. The first one, and the one I'm actually going to focus on here, because I think it's probably of most interest to this audience, is sort of embedded security apparatus on a server. Uh, the second case is sort of lightweight, scalable uh, network services on your local network. And the final case are sort of highly flexible, massively scaled components out in the cloud. So those are sort of three groups. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the first one here. So use case number one. Uh, this is a common picture of uh, I.O. in Zen. So you have a DOM U. It wants to talk on a network. It sends its network packet out on a virtual interface to DOM0. DOM0 gets that packet, puts it on a bridge, and there's all sorts of magic that happens, and eventually it gets out to the network card. So that's great. Uh, it occurred to us, and it occurred to a lot of other people, that you could very easily break that, and then you could put a little box in the middle, and then you could reroute the communication from DOM U to that box, and oh, that's interesting. Now you have a box that's in the middle of all your network communications. What this allows you to do is build things like unavoidable encryption, unavoidable filtering, unavoidable tunneling, that even if Windows, if that is a Windows and DOM U thing, even if it gets hacked, but the worst thing is possible, it cannot avoid your VPN or your encryption or your tunneling or whatever. This is a really handy thing when you really care about security because it decreases the sort of trusted base that you have to worry about from all of Windows to just that little box. And again, with unikernels, we can make that box very little, uh, which makes it nice. Again, you could go back to the Dornerworks talk earlier this morning, little is good for certification, uh, and so it's a nice property. In fact, you can even make things smaller. That box that I showed you before, that's actually a rough diagram of what we actually did in this case. There's actually a few more boxes that I'm not showing in this. Uh, this may make you, some of you blink in terror. Um, and the, but the nice thing about doing this is that we could uh, fix the permissions on each of those little boxes, and we could really hard code the communication channels within them. What this allowed us to do is, even if any one component in there got broken, by an attacker in somewhere, you could limit the extent of what that attack got you. So for example, key management was one component way off to the side. The random number generator was another. The network stack was the in another. Encryption and decryption were two different ones, so on and so forth. So if you broke the network stack, which is probably the most sensitive piece and one most likely to fail, you don't get your keys. You don't get access to the random number generator, anything like that. Really nice. One interesting thing, and I, I suspect I, I can read minds in this audience, and they're going, oh my god, you're expecting network traffic to go through one, two, three, four, five channels before it hits the network. Oh my god, isn't your latency and bandwidth going to hell? That was actually an interesting experiment that was part of this project. Turns out, no, um, if you're talking about humans. So I make no claims for server class systems. Um, but we were able to stream video through this, HD video in fact. We were able to carry on Skype communication through this, even though it was going through six channels. Um, can't remember now, we watched YouTube. That was fun. Um, so in terms of human perception, this does add some latency because you are make copying it six times on the way to the network. Um, but you can do it and it works just fine. So the lesson from this all, unikernels are small and they're fast and so they make a great platform for building these critical security components. They make a great platform for the Zen store uh, that James talked about yesterday, especially if you extend it with Mac. Makes a great platform for autopilots, which uh, Jonathan's going to talk to you about after the break, because we can run the autopilot in one domain and keep it safe from the webcam driver written by some intern 
uh, that's running in a Linux domain somewhere else. So they make a great platform for this sort of thing, especially if you combine them with XSM, because uh, you can use XSM to do very fine-grained policies about who can do what to whom, uh, which is a really nice thing. There is a but in here. So I probably said we've been mostly successful in using unikernels in this situation. Um, mostly is, of course, a very dangerous word. Um, there was one place it didn't work, which was we developed a device driver using a unikernel. Now, I'd like to point out that it's not writing device drivers in unikernels that's the problem. You can do that just fine, and we did it, actually. The trouble is that uh, device drivers require a lot of infrastructure, which was fresh and new for unikernels, didn't exist in the first place. So we had to build a lot of that from scratch. It didn't help that the device that our client chose had no documentation, so we were reverse engineering Linux code and all that sort of stuff. But we sort of got it working, and it was going great, and then our client called us up and said, actually, now I'm thinking maybe we should use this other network card, um, which meant that now we had to throw everything away. This is actually a problem with unikernels. Um, because we do this very narrow slicing of the bits of libraries we need, we develop only the libraries you necessarily need for this thing. So we had only developed the sort of library code we needed for this device driver. So then when we needed to pivot to a very different wireless network card driver, we had to completely reinvent all of that code. So the sort of takeaway from this is unikernels are a little, in some cases, brittle to ch big changes. So if you're gonna move from one system to another, in this case from one completely different wireless card to another, um, the port, the, that change cost can be very large. As opposed to if we'd used embedded Linux in the first place, it would have been a checkbox, right? That would have been a lot more convenient. Um, but it's something to keep in mind when you're building these things. Our IPsec stack, it, they did make changes along the way, and some of them were major, but they were major in the sense of, oh, I want to use elliptic curve instead of RSA, or this instead of this, in which case it was sort of a library swap in, swap out pretty easy in this case, the structure of the whole thing got maintained. But when you're massively changing what you're supporting in a device driver, that's a lot of code that you end up having to throw away and restart. So I don't have a transition off of that, so here's some bunnies. Um, so use case number two, So and this is your network, so not the cloud. I'm not gonna talk about the cloud yet. There will be cloud later. Right now we're talking about the fog. It's near you. Um, one of the things we're learning in sort of the network defense community is that firewalls are great and you should spend money to work on having good firewalls, but they are going to get broken or they're going to get bypassed. And you just need to accept that uh, in your heart and move on. And one of the ways you move on is you start thinking about how fast can I detect that an intruder is on my network and doing something bad. And if you start asking that question, then you start thinking about, okay, how can I make that attacker slower how can I make their job harder? And how can I detect them as fast as possible? We've actually used unikernels in all of those areas. So we've had a number of different projects um, in which we use unikernels to create fake looking hosts that on first, uh, first inspection, uh, they look like a Linux server or a Windows server or something. Because they're unikernels, we can create a couple hundred of them on the fly. It's really kind of nice. Means the attacker has to go through a very large nmap chain to figure out which one might be real and which one might, and they might guess wrong, in which case, voila, we can set off a sensor reading. We've also used them to make very dynamic uh, network graphs within a system. So you can have routers and layers of routers that talk to each other, and, and there's back paths and so on. So basically getting traffic out of it becomes a maze, which is kind of neat. Um, and we've also just used them as simple sensors. They sit on a network, they observe all the traffic that's going on on the network, and they can do analysis on whether they think this is a good thing or a bad thing or what have you. We've done a lot of these. Unikernels are great for this because you want them to be lightweight. You want to just throw them in there on your network, not have a big effect on your network. You don't want to spend a lot of time on them, um, especially consider something like a honeypot, which making a good honeypot is sort of an art in itself. Uh, these are pretty quick and easy to throw out. Uh, expanding from the fog to the clouds. Uh, so now use case number three. Um, Use case, uh, unikernels have a couple big advantages in the cloud. Um, in particular, they're very nimble and they scale massively because you can keep them rather small. Um, I was very excited to see Philippe's talk where we, he was doing up 10,000. That's awesome. Um, 
these two properties hold as long as your unikernel fits a certain mold. And that mold, I have a rule of thumb, and that rule of thumb is basically, do you need a local disk? If you need a disk, you start running into problems with expanding massively. Just a rule of thumb, there are th applications you can use where a disk makes it it's all great. But in general, when people come to me and say, should we use a unikernel of this, we start talking about how much state you need, how much persistent state you need across the system. So. There's this thing, Nimble is really handy. So I, go, I travel a lot, and I go to hotels, and they say, oh, we have free wire f uh, wireless. And that is supposed to make me very happy, because I get free internet connectivity and so forth. Um, unfortunately, it actually makes me very sad or alarmed, as the case may be. And this is because I know about this tool called Wireshark, um, and I know how to use it, and I know how much data gets transmitted on a public wireless network. So that's a little scary. Now I got over this fear because I found this tool called SSH and I can SSH back to my house and then I can route all my traffic back through my house and it's all encrypted and no one can see my traffic on the local thing. Great. Now I'm happy again. Trouble is, uh, last year I traveled to Edinburgh for this Zen developer segment. I live in Portland, Oregon. SSH tunneling from Edinburgh to Portland took a while. Um, especially when I wanted to read something about Edinburgh, so my traffic ended going all the way back to Portland and then all the way back to Scotland, which was a bit of a round trip time. So it occurred to me, wouldn't it be nice if I could just move my host over here? Or even ideally, what if I just had a few hosts that I could bounce traffic around locally in Europe, or maybe even had a couple on the eastern seaboard, and I could get all this traffic a lot faster. And wouldn't it be nice if I could just bill them set them up, let them go, turn them on, connect to them, be done. Or they could just sit there, ready for me to connect to, not doing anything until I hit a ping. Uh, and if I went that way, well, maybe I could just have them all over the world, maybe even have one in Antarctica, because that would be awesome. Um, and that would be great. But of course, maybe I don't necessarily trust the hosts of all these companies, these uh, server farms where I'm running all these things. So maybe I could even put some smarts in where they, I took, I transferred, I connect via SSH to a node, I put all my tra traffic through that, but it actually connects to a different node and transfers my traffic over there and bounces it all around so that no one at any of these server farms can tell exactly what I'm doing. And those of you who are listening to what I'm saying instead of being hypnotized by my voice are making, are going, ha, huh, that sounds like Tor. Um, so that's actually something we've been really interested in, we're actually building right now is a HalVM uh, Tor node. So this is a Haskell implementation of Tor, which gives you a high level description of what Tor does, and you can see what it does and see what it looks like. And it runs on the HalVM, so you can just launch it in a cloud provider wherever you want. Plus, Unikernel's great, the scaling factor is great for this, right? More Tor nodes in existence, the better for everyone in the universe. And so, this is a great application for Unikernels. Who would have thought? So, that's all I, had about stuff that we did just in summary. Unikernels, what are they? They're sort of a lightweight mechanism for implementing single service components. Who wants them? I particularly think they're useful in the areas of cloud, in local network sensors, in local network security, and in sort of low level security services you might put on a server or a laptop. Where are they useful? They're useful for securing or rapidly deploying these lightweight services. When are they useful? I've sort of gone over some situations when I think they're useful and we can chat about others. And why would you do this? To save money, to improve efficiency, or uh, from my company's point of view, the biggest thing is to improve the security of the system as a whole. So, uh, in summary, unikernels, useful. Um, at least for us. Um, when do you want to use them? Well, there's this equation about, let's take the advantages of the unikernels, let's take some of the disadvantages, and let's explore whether we think it works for this project. I've given you some examples that I hope can provide some guidance, um, but I'd love to chat with you about where you were thinking of using unikernels, where I've convinced you you could use them now, or where I've convinced them, you that you shouldn't use them in some way like that. Um, the HellVM, I don't know why that, I think Anil snuck into my slides and made that <laughs> much less visible. But if you go to hellvm.org, you can find the HellVM. It's on GitHub, it's free, it's BSD, it's great, you should use it. Or you can use a lesser alternative, which is openmirage.org. <laughs> yeah. So, that's all I have. So are there any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, 
Right, so I don't actually have numbers for the Tor node yet because it's still in development. And actually, for those of you developing unikernels, uh, the best way to do it is to develop your program not on Zen because you get some really nice debugging stuff in Linux. And then at the end, start running it on Zen. Really great thing. So I've been mostly f working on Linux. The Helvium itself boots in milliseconds. Um, it makes for really bad demos um, because it just looks like I'm starting a process and people go, why is this special? Um, the only cool thing you can do is actually, the Helvium can boot, do a useful computation and come down too fast for XL. And so XL in that case will crash, um, which is kind of awesome. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I expect with the Tor node, the actual boot, so th it's, th it's actually an interesting question. So booting the Helvium and starting to do useful work, probably on the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds, right? Now actually starting operation in Tor is gonna be a little while longer. It turns out there's a bunch of HTTP GET requests you have to do to get all sorts of directory information and all that sort of stuff. You have to compute a bunch of public keys, compute a bunch of signatures and that sort of thing. So I'm not actually sure what the end-to-end -end time will be at this case, but um, I presume faster than booting Linux and starting a you know, Tor process. Anyone else? Oh, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the, in fact, that's what we ended up doing. Um, actually, what we ended up doing is just booting the device driver, and we, at the time, and we still have a uh, high-speed uh, memory ring implementation for the Hell VM. We have a C version as well, and so we just connected it via that. So it just com communicated via basically a custom ring that spat packets as fast as it could. Um, that's, by the way, how you get packets in a rapid manner through six domains to Windows, is you use uh, high-speed shared grant pages and that sort of thing. Works great. Yes? So I'm wondering, you know, some of these So, so, we're getting better about talking to each other. Um, I tell the funny story that um, I, th the LVM was a project I was hired to do and I spent some time working on it and I built this thing and then we were gonna travel to Cambridge uh, to meet the Zen folks about some other things and we had this great new thing that we were really excited to tell them all about which was the LVM, high level language so their formal methods people would like it and Zen so the systems group would like it, it was great. So we traveled all the way out to Cambridge we said, hey, we have this thing, it's the Helvium, it's great. And then Neil turns to us and goes, oh yeah, we have an OCaml one too. We were like, <laughs> why didn't you tell us? And then he said, why didn't you tell me? Um, and we, we argued for a while. Uh, it took us about three years to recover from that. And then um, we moved on. So there is some stuff that we're doing. We, we talk, um, so we've gotten to the point where we now use, we all use the same math library, for example. Uh, we just released a sort of minimal C library that you can use on top of Unikernels that we're hoping a whole bunch of people will pick up um, that offers basically libc functionality, but without a file system, which is hard to find in some places. Um, it's really dumb. It basically returns enosis for everything, but at least you get all your linkers working out and the headers look right and that sort of thing. So there's starting to be this uh, sort of consortium of unikernels that are hopefully going to start centering on some good core pieces that we can share. Yeah. 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 So hopefully, I mean, a rising tide raises all ships, right? So um, I make fun of Anil, but I hope he does really well because I think that it will help the LVM as well. The more that unikernels get used, the more people will think about using unikernels for their application, at which point, honestly, it becomes mostly about what's your favorite programming language, right? Do you like OCaml, or do you like Haskell, or are you one of those weirdos that likes C? Um, you know, you pick the one you like, so, yeah.
Yes. Yep. So um, I think of Docker, so uh, I probably can't zip past this. So I'm just going to hit this real hard while I vamp for a while and see if anyone notices that I'm doing that. Um, so there's this, uh, there we are. Right, so there's this continuum, right, from full-blown operating systems all the way to Minios, which gives you basically nothing, right? I think of Docker, Docker as another thing that fits sort of here in the middle. I don't think it's like Mirage or the HalVM because Docker is more tuned towards taking existing programs and some of the infrastructure around them and putting them in a, in a, a container somewhere. So I, I think of it as slightly more heavyweight uh, than a unikernel solution. So it's an interesting midpoint that's popped up in sort of the mint in the meantime, um, and that's all I'm going to say on that. Okay. Yeah. So the Halvium supports Haskell as the major programming language. You can link in C on the side. I'm going to put a big asterisk next to that, right, because uh, linking C can be a um, adventure in dependencies, and you can get in yourself into some very bad places. So you could naively think, oh, why don't I just link OpenSSL, for example? It's because OpenSSL uses 15 bajillion libraries under the hood, and you have to track them all down and link them in separately. And eventually, you're going to get to something that wants to read on disk, right? It's pretty manual right now. Um, if you have C that you're writing, we have a very automatic process to compile that C and link it into a HAL VM. But referencing outside libraries, that's not automated yet. But I'll put it on my list of things to do. Anything else? Great. I think there might be snacks.